Wonderful, wonderful. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, I have the real pleasure of introducing Dr. Arjun Mohan. Arjun, I think this is the first time I've had the opportunity to introduce you. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to introduce you. Dr. Mohan is one of our newest faculty in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. I'd just like to provide you a little bit of his background. Um, Dr. Mohan completed his uh, medical training in India and subsequently conducted a residency at the University of Miami, followed by uh, a fellowship at SUNY Buffalo. Um, he's been at uh, East Carolina, the Brody School of Medicine since 2015. And in the last few months, we were very fortunate to recruit Dr. Mohan to our division. I'll give you a little bit of his clinical interests. Dr. Mohan is really considered an emerging thought leader in asthma, particularly in the area of advanced therapeutics and biologics in particular. He's led multiple clinical trials, mostly industry sponsored, but also NIH associated trials focused on biologics in advanced asthma. He also has an emerging uh, reputation on a national level uh, within the American Thoracic Society, uh, serving now on the planning committee of the AII assembly. He's published over two dozen manuscripts um, and he's mentored several junior faculty during the course of his relatively short career. Um, and we're really looking, <clears throat> excuse me, looking forward to really great things from Dr. Mohan, uh, particularly in leading an asthma program. He'll be collaborating very closely with our colleagues in rheumatology, as well as our colleagues in pediatrics who have ongoing asthma programs with the goal of really expanding access for all of our patients um, to management of their um, asthma. With that being said, Dr. Mohan is going to be talking about the evolution of asthma management guidelines, inhalers, and beyond. Dr. Mohan, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Pat. Thank you for your kind introduction and also for nominating me to give this pulmonary grand rounds today. I think I'm very privileged to be talking about asthma so early into my appointment at VCU. This is an exciting time for asthma management, and I just want to share a little bit about it with you folks today. And hopefully, everyone walks away with an improved knowledge of asthma management. In terms of my conflicts, I have no financial conflicts. Now, I have some experience with certain drugs such as benzodiazepam and tenofovir outside the routine clinical areas because I was involved in industry-sponsored trials with these drugs. So here are my objectives. I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you'll get a sense of the epidemiology of asthma and its true impact. I'm also hoping that you'll be able to recognize the need for a thorough data a evaluation and a proper diagnosis when it comes to asthma. And that is a point I'm going to be emphasizing quite heavily. We're going to be talking about a new update to the GINA 2020 report. And finally, we're also going to learn about new biological therapies, which, and their role in the management of a particular phenotype of asthma called the type 2 high asthma. As you can probably realize, this is going to be more of a global view type of a hand on presentation. I took the liberty of not going to a specific topic in detail just because there hasn't been a asthma So asthma is a Greek term for panting of breathlessness, and as one of my colleagues pointed out, it truly means struggling for air. Um, I think we all have patients who we relate this term with. The latest definition of asthma is quite interactive. Asthma is defined as a heterogeneous disease usually characterized by chronic airway limitation. Uh, it is defined by a cluster of respiratory symptoms and spirometric findings. And the respiratory symptoms typical for asthma. Over time and intensity. Now, together with what we call as variable expiratory airflow limitation, we can really make the diagnosis of asthma prim and proper. In certain patients, airflow limitation can become persistent. Now, there are two major reports that have been coming out. There's been a bunch of national ones, but the ones that I think we should focus on are the Global Initiative for Asthma, which is also called GINA. GINA has been around since the 1990s, and the panel has done a very good job of putting out reports on a consistent basis. There is an NIH, NHLBI-based body called the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program, now that has also been putting out reports, but not very consistently. In fact, the last time they had a comprehensive update was in 2007. And, and, and sort of unfortunately for me, they also put out their 2020 update about a week ago. So I'm gonna do my very best to bring in some of the NAEPP report recommendations as well. But if I miss something, you must forgive me. <laughs> 
So this is to give you a sense of the global prevalence of asthma. And as you can imagine, asthma is, is an international disease. There's very few areas of the globe that are not affected by asthma. It's estimated that there are about 340 million asthmatics in the world today. Now, if you look at the prevalence data in the United States, it's been pretty steady at about seven to eight percent of the population. And as of now, it's been estimated we have about 25 million asthmatics living in America. Now, these folks have go through a lot. The disease of asthma has a huge impact at various levels. So let's look at it from the patient level itself. Merely having a diagnosis of severe asthma is associated with more number of work days lost, more number of school days lost, more number of physician office visits, increased limitation to both outdoor as well as daily activities, increased risk of progression to a very concerning finding called fixed airway obstruction, and a sixth-fold high risk of having exacerbations, which we all can realize are pretty bad outcomes to have. If you look at it from a healthcare perspective, it was estimated that those 25 million asthmatics in one year accounted for about 14 million exacerbations. Now this translated to about 11 million office visits, 2 million emergency department visits, 500,000 hospitalization, and even today, despite the wealth of clinical and research experience, about 3,400 deaths per year. So that comes to about nine asthma-related deaths per year, which is quite unacceptable. Now, all of this also leads to a huge economic footprint. So in this 2018 report, it was estimated that asthma-related costs came to about $82 billion per year. Now, this is not apples to apples, but to give you some context, COPD, CVA, and heart failure are, are about 50, 34, and $30 billion per year. So asthma definitely has a large economic burden for all of us. The annual cost of asthma per patient per year was just about $3,200. And in this report, it was very interesting to know that a lion's share of that amount came from prescription medications. Now, we all who have had experience with prescribing inhalers know how tedious the process can be and how expensive the process can be. So I'm glad this report kind of harped on that rather than putting the onus on hospital utilization costs, which were actually not been that much. Here is... I have two more slides on prevalence, then I'm gonna move on to the more management aspect of my talk. So here is a geo map of asthma prevalence throughout the United States. Now we certainly have some heavy hitting country areas such as New Hampshire and Puerto Rico that have prevalence rates as high as 13%. And you have some low prevalence areas such as Texas, which is right about 7%. Virginia joins the Carolinas and sits at about eight to 9%. Now this slide was truly, truly revealing to me I was preparing for this talk and I found this slide on the Department of Health website. So here's that 9% mark I kind of mentioned to you earlier. If you draw a line right about that at 10% and see who makes that cutoff, you do notice that the female asthmatics tend to make that cutoff. But concerningly, you also notice that African-American non-Hispanics, patients belonging to a lower economic uh, bracket, and patients with a lower educational status tend to make those cutoffs. Now, those three demographics in particular have always been looked at as demographics more prone to bad asthma outcomes. So I think there is a true unmet need in the state of Virginia, and it really hasn't come up to the surface as, as strongly as it should. With that little introduction in mind, let's move on more to the management aspect of asthma. Now, the first thing you need to understand about the management aspect of asthma is the evolution has, of management has paralleled the evolution of our understanding of asthma. So historically, we used to consider asthma to be a disease of muscle spasm disorder. So we used to think bronchoconstriction is the most key feature of asthma. And dating back to 3000 BC, there have been extracts such as the Mahuang extract, which you can mix with the tea, that were kind of directed at negating that bronchospasm. Need, and around the turn of 1900s, we also see other agents coming out that kind of target that bronchospasm, such as ephedrine, and what they used to call asthma cigarettes and pipes, which were basically combustible datura and belladonna that had anti muscarinic properties in it. It wasn't until the 1940s that we started realizing that, hey, asthma is a condition that's actually driven by inflammation. But for the longest period of time, we used to think eosinophilic inflammation was the one size that fits all. We had agents such as cortisone then starting to make its way into the treatment regimen of asthma. And then in the 70s and 90s is where we start inhaler therapies coming out. For those who are unfamiliar, Saba is what I'm gonna use when I'm referring to a short acting beta agonist. ICS is what I'm gonna use when I'm referring to an inhaled corticosteroid. And LABA is what I'm gonna use when I'm talking about a long acting beta agonist. 
And these inhalers kind of held ground for almost three decades. It wasn't until we got into the 2000s that we realized that there are different types of asthma and patients A's asthma experience may be very different from patient B's asthma experience. And we have ways of kind of quantifying and characterizing these expressions very well. And that's what's called phenotyping. It's when we understood phenotyping and then took it to a step further called endotyping, which is where we look at mechanisms that drive phenotypes. That's when we started to come up with targeted therapies directed to particular pathways in asthma. So for example, in 2000, we came up with a therapy that was targeted to as anti-IgE. Almost a decade and a half later, we came up with a therapy targeted against free-floating interleukin-5. And more recently, we've actually started targeting therapies against anti-interleukin-4 receptors. And if you didn't catch all of that, don't worry. That's going to be what we talk about in the next few slides. I feel it's always helpful to have a consistent approach towards every asthmatic. And I'm going to use this not just as a way of saying this is how I approach my asthma patients, but also divide the next 15 slides with this index card. So the first thing you want to do, be it in your initial visit or in your follow-up visit, is establish goals for management of asthma. And you're going to establish two goals. You're going to establish symptom goals, and you're going to establish risk reduction goals. The next thing you're going to do, especially in your initial visit, is spend a lot of time making sure you get the diagnosis right. To get the diagnosis right, you're going to do three things. You're going to generate a clinical probability that this patient has asthma. You're going to rule out mimickers and factor in comorbid conditions. And then you're going to spend some time trying to get your spirometric confirmation or peak for confirmation of what we're going to refer to as variable expiratory airflow limitation. And I'll walk you through all of that as well. I didn't like using the word profiling, but that's the best way to describe what we do next. Um, we try and assess the severity of disease in a patient, and that's the severity classification. And for some of us, we do spend some time trying to understand what is unique or what is observable about that particular patient's asthma, right? And that's called phenotyping. Finally, we move on to therapy, and that's where I'm going to be talking to you about pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. So what are the goals of treating asthma or managing asthma? Well, the symptom goals are kind of intuitive. You do want your patients to have as few asthma symptoms as possible, but you also need to keep an eye on asthma-related nocturnal awakenings and sleep disturbances and asthma-related exercise limitations and limitations to activities of daily living. The risk reduction goals, well, we do think about two of them quite consistently, and that's preventing flare-ups or exacerbations and obviously preventing any asthma-related deaths. But things that we may not always consider is interventions that may help your patients maintain their lung functions and also constant vigilance and monitoring of medication side effects because all therapies, including inhalers, have some form of side effects on the patient. My colleagues in North Carolina used to joke at one point that I was the largest prescriber of Nystatin Swish and Swallow given the amount of lingual thrush I used to treat in my clinic but I'm hoping that label doesn't stick with me in Virginia. A few more points about goals and what we should think about is you do need to fa factor in the patient's experience at this point. You know, The patient's goals may be very different from what you think is a reasonable goal. So for example, I've had patients whose main request has been to give them medications to use at home to protect them from going to the emergency room from exacerbations. So those may be patients I sometimes kind of get to know, understand, and give some credence on to keep at home. And I have other patients whose only request was to stay as functional as possible, exercise or play with their grandkids. The other interesting thing to keep in mind about goals is that symptoms and risks may be discordant. What I mean by that is I've had patients who have had exacerbations frequently, but no symptoms in between. And then I've had patients who have had a huge symptom burden, but no exacerbations throughout the year. So at every visit, it's kind of important to assess both. So you've done that. You've kind of set your goals in front of you, right? So the next thing I'm going to emphasize on is making sure you get the diagnosis right. So this is a, a diagnostic flowchart that I've adapted from Gina. And at first glance, it seems like something we would do all the time anyways. We're going to look for symptoms typical for asthma, and we're going to look for a history and examination that support the diagnosis. And obviously, if you don't get those, we're going to look for alternative diagnosis to treat. But if we get those two things, the area that we all should spend a lot of time on is trying to establish spirometry-based or peak flow-based 
supportive, supportive evidence for the diagnosis of asthma itself. If you get all three, you could go ahead and start treating asthma. But if you don't, there are some bailouts for you on this flowchart. The first one is, is you can wait and re-challenge re the diagnosis at the next appointment. And also, if your patient has a clinical urgency to the presentation, for example, if they have a lot of symptom burden, you can definitely start treating with in initial inhalers and then kind of reevaluate the diagnosis um, in one to three, three months. I wanna make three points before I move on. The first one being, it is always easier to make the diagnosis before initiation of treatment than after initiation of treatment. You know, And along those same lines, there was one study where about 30% of patients who had a five-year diagnosis of asthma were unable to achieve spirometric reconfirmation of diagnosis after complete withdrawal of inhalers. So one out of three patients is a huge number to get to potentially get the diagnosis wrong on. And finally, there was a study that showed that 2%, which is a small number, but quite large if you think about the prevalence of asthma, 2% of patients with an asthma diagnosis actually had other serious cardiopulmonary diagnoses that were missed because of the asthma diagnosis. So get the diagnosis right. Spend some time doing that. Your next obvious question is, well, is there something that can help me with that? Well, the first thing you need to do is get your clinical probability right. And there are certain features which drive up your clinical probability and certain features which drive down your clinical probability of asthma. So what are the symptoms that you're gonna be watching for? Wheeze, shortness of breath, cough and chest tightness. You get more than one of these, that pushes up your probability. You get the fact that they tend to be more at night or early in the morning, the fact that they're variable in time and intensity, or you can elicitate uh, associated trigger, that drives up your clinical probability. Let's say you have a patient who comes in with isolated cough, or if they endorse a lot of sputum production with their cough, or the dizziness has atypical features associated with it, such as I'm sorry, the dyspnea has atypical features associated with it, such as dizziness, tingling, or chest pain, or if they have a huge cardiac history that's, that they're bringing with them. Those are the kind of things that will drive the clinical probability of my asthma diagnosis down. This list of possible mimickers and comorbid conditions, unfortunately, is not exhaustive. Um, there are a lot more diagnoses that you can add to this list, but I just wanted to highlight a few. Ones that kind of coexist with asthma and mimic asthma and influence asthma include obesity, upper airway cough syndrome, allergic rhinitis, and acid reflux. I've also seen patients who have had vocal cord dysfunction and asthma. So what I want to leave you with is that BCD is not necessarily an exclusionary criteria to having an asthma diagnosis. So just keep these three four things in mind and keep trying to optimize them with your asthmatics. But at the same time, always remember that they can mimic asthma as well. COPD and heart failure, those always come up in my differential, especially if I have a smoker or a patient who's older. Those can definitely show up as asthma if you're not very careful about them. So you generated your clinical probability. You've kind of spent some time looking for comorbid conditions and mimickers. The next big thing that you want to do is establish variable expiratory airflow limitations. And there are five ways of doing this. The first way, the one we all pray for in our clinic is bronchodilator reversibility, right? So this is where your patient comes in. He sounds like he has asthma. You put them through initial spirometry. They have airflow obstruction. You give them some albuterol and the airflow obstruction goes away and you see an improvement of FEV1 that's significant. You got your diagnosis. There's nothing else that you need to do you're, you're off to the races. Unfortunately, and more so in the adult world, this doesn't happen as often as we hope it would. So we, we think of other ways of skinning this cat. And one that's been around at least for a long period of time historically has been peak expiratory flow rate monitoring. So you give your patients a peak expiratory flow meter and they document their readings over two weeks, morning and evening. And when they come back, you see if those numbers are variable and that's how you can make a diagnosis. Kind of splitting the, the difference is a four-week trial of anti-inflammatory treatment. So they come in, they do their spirometry maneuver, you give them therapy, and then you recheck their spirometry after therapy and show the FEV1 goes up. You can use that as a loose surrogate as well. And one that's 
kind of something that we're all somewhat familiar with and one that I lean on quite a bit is bronchoprovocative testing. And methacholine challenge, for example, is a test where I would use airway hyperresponsiveness as a very good surrogate or what some people even regard as a gold standard for a diagnosis of asthma. The last way that's probably the least reliable way that I'm shameful to admit I use quite a bit as well is getting serial spirometries and showing over time people's FEV1s do a go up and down and saying that, hey, this patient does have intertest lung function variability and I'm gonna use that along with my clinical probability to make my diagnosis of asthma. This is just a figure that I'm using to kind of continue to emphasize my point. So this is, a, this is a graph that looks at different concentrations of methacholine that have been used to um, show a 20% drop in FEV1, i.e. airway hyperresponsiveness. And here you can see that the post-test probability of a true asthma diagnosis is actually highly dependent on your pre-test probability of an asthma diagnosis. So remember, it's the clinical probability of a diagnosis alongside your airway testing that really takes the diagnosis home. So you set your goals you made your diagnosis. The next thing you wanna do is start looking into severity classification. This is the severity classification that's been around since 2007 that was put out by the NAEPP guidelines, expert panel three report, so the EPR three report, right? And it is something that we are all familiar with. It is beautiful in a sense that it kind of brings together symptoms with lung functions, with exacerbations, and it appears to be very, very interactive. But I have some personal grievances with this classification system. The first one is, it gives you the sense that asthma exists in a continuum, that patients progressed through stages of mild, moderate, and severe. And that's less of a grievance for me than the fact that it gives a sense that patients with severe asthma, for example, will necessarily perform worse than those with mild asthma, or even worse, vice versa, that patients with mild asthma perform better than let's say moderate or severe. So this study for two, from 2007 essentially drives my point home. So about 30 to 37% of patients with exacerbations in the study, 16% of patients with neofatal exacerbations. So these were flare-ups requiring mechanical support such as intubation or BiPAP. And 15, of, 15 to 20% of patients with a fatal exacerbation, i.e. they died of asthma, had a, um, symptom-based classification of mild asthma in the last three months. So I feel that mild asthma label may have been a missed opportunity for these patients in the last three months. And with that in mind, I would say that this table has probably had its moment in the sun and it's time to move on from it. But there's very little out there to kind of help us do so. One thing that we lean on as subspecialists is the European Respiratory American Thoracic Society definition of asthma. And this definition is actually used to flesh out patients with severe asthma, but you can use it to kind of divide patients into two boxes, severe and non-severe asthma. This definition is based on how much medication the patient is on and whether despite being on that much medication, the asthma is controlled or not. So what is a lot of medication for somebody to be called severe asthma? Well, if you're on a lot of inhaler therapy, like GINA step four, five therapy, that's high dose inhaled corticosteroid with a long acting beta agonist, or if you spent more than 50% of your previous years being on chronic corticosteroids, and despite being on one of those things, if you have a lot of issues with symptoms, or if you have frequent exacerbations, or if you have severe exacerbations, or if you have fixed airflow limitation, then you actually meet our society's guidelines for a severe asthma diagnosis. And these are the patients who typically don't do too well. The other reason that this definition is very well looked upon is the fact that it is translatable. By that, I mean it is the definition that's been used in clinical trials and studies for almost two decades now. So when you're using that literature and applying it to your patients, you can certainly use this definition quite seamlessly. So moving away from severity and leaving that up in the air, we can also start to understand these key concepts here called phenotyping and endotyping. So let me walk you through those terms and what they actually mean. It became apparent to us in the 1990s and early 2000s that asthma is not a single disease, it is actually a syndrome. And within that syndrome are clinically observable characteristics that differentiate one patient from another called phenotypes, right? 
Now, if we use certain parameters, such as age of onset, genetics, and environment, and then apply statistical clustering, we can divide asthmatics into very nice boxes. And those were our phenotypic boxes that we came up with. This generated a lot of excitement as it, it was felt that this was our true first step towards precision medicine. Unfortunately, time has told us that phenotyping did not translate into actionable items. By that, I mean phenotyping patients didn't necessarily help us prognosticate better and didn't necessarily help us provide st specific strategies for managing asthma patients better. So then we went one step further. We asked ourselves, what are the biologically plausible mechanisms that explain certain phenotypes? And that's how we came up with the concept of endotypes. And that's where we started to find out a lot more science and also start looking at specific interventions. When it all settled, we came up with two endotypes, right? Um, for the learners and trainees in this audience, I do want to point out this reference. It is a 2017 New England Journal of Medicine reference by Elliot Israel and Helen Riddell. And it's a very good read if you're interested in this space. All right, so coming back to these to this figure from this reference, right? So it tells me that um, patients can be put into two endotypic boxes. You have one box, which is your type two inflammation, and that tends to be more common. It's also called your TH2 type or type two high inflammation. It is uh, the endotype that is characterized by type two lymphocytes. It has certain cytokines unique to it, particularly interleukin four, five, and 13. And the downstream cells that have been picked up in this endotype uh, eosinophils. Now, this is also the endotype that's associated with a strong allergic component to it. This tends to be more common. This tends to be the one more research has been done on. And this is also the endotype where we have more therapeutic options for. The less common endotype is the non-type 2 in inflammation. As suggested by its name, you don't have those TH2 cells mediating it. And sometimes you get neutrophils as a downstream cells in this inflammatory phenotype, or sometimes you don't get any cells at all. One of the main reasons this dichotomous classification is super helpful is because we can actually use biomarkers to divide patients into one of two buckets. Now, the commonly used clinical biomarkers that we have, and each of them has their own pros and cons, are eosinophil counts from a serum blood draw, um, from a whole blood draw, sorry, your exhaled nitric oxide, what we call a pheno or an FENO, and sputum eosinophils. So using one of these three or all of them in conjunction helps you very neatly put patients into boxes. Take a snapshot of this cartoon. I'm gonna reference it when I explain biological therapies in a few slides from now. All right, so here's where we are at, right? So we kind of establish some very good goals for managing or diagnosing your patients. Then you really spend some time getting sure you have the asthma diagnosis, right? Then you kind of apply the severity classification and you went one step further and actually did a little bit of phenotyping. And with that background in mind, let's go into interventions. The first thing you need to understand about taking care of asthma is, is now recommended that we move in a controlled based management cycle, right? So every time a patient comes in, you're gonna apply the cycle to them, review, assess, and adjust. And you're gonna see what you need to optimize to achieve better symptom control. And the big buzzword is symptom control. So how do you understand symptom control, asthma symptom control, and how do you separate it from what severity is? Well, the easiest way to think about it is severity is a property of disease, and we actually have little influence in it. But asthma control reflects the adequacy of treatment, and that's where we play the most significant role. So the better the treatment, the better is the control. The next question you may have is, how do I assess control? Well, you probably do it already every time your patient comes in for an asthma follow-up by asking these series of questions, but there are questionnaires out there that help you do it in a more numerical way. And the one that I like using is the asthma control test. So it asks you five questions and then grades your answers from a scale of one to five, right? So the five questions being, how often does your asthma keep you away from work, school, or home? How often do you have shortness of breath? How often do you wake up at night or in the early morning with asthma? How often do you use your rescue medication? And how do you perceive your asthma control to be? If your total score comes to 19 or higher, it tends to reflect good asthma control. And if it's less than that, poor asthma control. I like the asthma control test for three reasons. One, it is the test 
that I've kind of trained with is what I used in my fellowship. Two, it does seamlessly integrate with my clinic flow. So these are questions I would ask in my follow-up visits anyway. So let's say, for example, my triage nurse hands this questionnaire to the patient before I walk into the room. That's a lot of the burden of history that's already done for me. But three, and this is the most important reason why I like the asthma control test, it is free. The patent on it expired. You can get it from Google and download it for free. And when you're talking about a disease state that comes to $82 billion per year, you take free every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So please start using this to assess your patient's asthma control. The more you use it, the more familiar you get with it, the more you'll start appreciating it. So you're looking at control, right? And you're thinking, hey, maybe I need to do a better job to kind of understand why my patient's asthma um, can be, where my patient's asthma can be optimized. Well, let's start, start off by talking about non-pharmacological measures. The first thing you need to keep in mind is asthma is truly a partnership with your patient. Uh, you need to establish, a, establish your role in the asthma management scheme for each patient and tell them that you may be that go-to physician to call if they get into trouble. That also kind of helps your patients understand that asthma is an up and down kind of disease and they're gonna have good days and bad days. Once you've done that, you do wanna spend a significant amount of time working on inhaler use. So there've been innumerable st studies that have shown that inhaler adherence and improving inhaler, inhaler techniques by themselves improve asthma control in up to 80% of asthmatics with severe asthma. That is easier said than done. This is straight from up to date. This is the number of steps involved with using a different kind of drug delivery device. And you can see the number of steps can, can be quite extensive. So there's no easy way of doing this. It's just about putting in the time to do it. And again, there have been studies that have shown that inhaler reminder programs not only improve asthma control, but also improve asthma exacerbation frequency. So in my previous practice, for example, I was fortunate enough to have a respiratory therapist who was a certified asthma educator and she would go in behind me on certain patients who were difficult to treat and kind of work on the inhalers. And that was a high reward intervention for us in our practice. The next place where you should spend some time, and I'm gonna say this tongue in cheek because really environmental hygiene optimization is always tricky in adults, is looking at what triggers patient's asthma. Now, this is a list of things that commonly trigger patient's asthma. You may be familiar with it. Inhale allergens such as house dust mites, HTM, cockroaches, pet dander, pollen, respiratory infections, cigarette smoke, weather, particularly change in weather or cold weather, certain types of medication, food and emotional states, right? And I just wanted to highlight that while some of them have a very well established role, it's very difficult to have a meaningful intervention on them. And the other ones have the other problem where you can make an intervention, but we're unsure of their role. So let's go through some of these bolded points just to get a sense of what I'm talking about. Inhale allergens. Well, if you're talking about complete allergen mediation, it is very difficult. You're talking about things like removing carpets and putting down hardwood floors, and it's very expensive as well. Now, there is a huge role for allergen immunotherapy, and I'll bring that up when we talk about our GINA steps. Cigarette smokes and pulmonary, cigarettes smoking in pulmonary is always a very high, high yield intervention and something we should do for all our patients. But I think that even I sometimes tend to miss is spending time and looking at the medication list. You know, aspirin and non-steroidals, for, for example, I've seen a fair bit of patients whose disease was purely driven by those two things. One last point to kind of put everything together. So if you have a patient with possible severe asthma, right? Let's say you have 100 asthmatics. Almost 24% of them will be on significant therapy. And of, of those 100, about 17 of them will still not have control achieved. You work on three things, inhaler education and compliance, treating comorbid conditions, and we're talking specifically about acid reflux and allergic rhinitis, and working on the environmental hygiene. Just doing those three things by themselves can optimize control in a majority of patients. And finally, the number left behind with uncontrolled asthma is about less than 4%. Now that 4% is actually the, the asthmatics who are the true severe asthmatics or the refractory asthmatics. And those are the patients that tend to have poor outcomes. And those are the patients who we consider for advanced therapies. So I would say just keep these three interventions in mind and work on it as best as you can during your clinic visits. But let's say you've done all of that. The next thing you're gonna talk about or think about is medications, the pharmacological interventions. Now, these are the 
GINA steps that we may be familiar with. Step one was an as needed albuterol inhaler. Step two was a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. At step three, you were mostly adding a long acting beta agonist to inhale corticosteroid. Four involved you increasing the dose of your ICS. At five, you're increasing the dose further and considering omalizumab that's been around since 2003. And step six is where you were considering putting your patients on chronic oral corticosteroids, which by themselves have a lot of toxicity associated with them. In the old version of GINA, we also had subcutaneous allergen immune therapy for patients who had allergic asthma. So how did these guidelines, and I know it's, I'm calling it a guideline, but it's actually a report of strategy. How did they change over the last three years? Well, we already went through one of the big changes. They put this assess, adjust, review cycle. They actually dropped off step six. So now the thinking is at step five and beyond, you need to be thinking of advanced therapies alongside or before pulling the trigger on chronic steroids. The more recent guidelines have started to emphasize house dust mites, sublingual immunotherapy for patients who are sensitized with HDMs and have allergic rhinitis and an FEV1 more than 70%. And this is where there's a little bit of controversy brewing because the latest NAEPP guidelines is still sticking with subcutaneous immunotherapy. There was this very eloquent figure that was added to the newer guidelines called, called when to start where. And it kind of drive, it kind of put the point out there that asthma therapy is not a stepwise escalation because that was being done. People were starting at step one and then going to step two, but in the right patients, you may go ahead and even start with step four, for example. But the biggest thing that was kind of mind blowing is the fact that Gina started to move away from albuterol as your rescue inhaler or your reliever therapy. And that took a lot of convincing before they started putting that in guidelines. So you will learn in the next five or six slides that the replacement as your go-to reliever of choice is now gonna be a low dose inhaled corticosteroid or formitrol combination. And this strategy of taking away albuterol and using a single inhaler for maintenance and relief therapy is called SMART, right? So let's understand and learn about SMART strategy. Before we do that, let's understand why we don't like albuterol as much as we used to. Well, we've known this for almost two decades now. People who tend to use their albuterol regularly or frequently have bad things happen to them. Um, over time, the beta receptors get downregulated. They have decreased bronchoprotection. They tend to have rebound hyperresponsiveness also concerningly, they tend to have increased allergic responses and an increased tendency towards eosinophilic inflammation. So albuterol by itself is associated with a lot of bad things when used regularly. So that's the main reason there's been a lot of science and literature coming up with SMART strategy. So this is uh, the use of budesonide formitrol and specifically for maintenance and rescue. So there's no albuterol involved in your patient's inhaler regimen scheme anymore. It goes by some other names such as single inhaler therapy or just mark without the S. And it's based around the fact that formitrol as a long acting beta agonist has a very rapid onset of action and hence can be used as a rescue. So when compared to fluticasone salmitrol adware, I'm gonna say a few industry terms here, forgive me, adware with albutrol or Symbicot with albutrol, SMART, which is just Symbicot with Symbicot, was associated with decreased rates of exacerbation increased time to severe exacerbation, and an overall decrease in the amount of inhaled corticosteroid exposure. So there was this signal brewing, and to kind of support it, there have been some very well done double-blinded placebo-controlled study. And the one I'm gonna show you here is the Sigma-1 study. So this was a 52-week study looking at patients with mild asthma, and they put patients into one of three boxes. The first box, patients received only an as-needed short-acting beta agonist. In the second box, patients received a combination of a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid um, formitrol inhaler that they used when they had symptoms. And in the third box, these mild asthma patients has received inhaled corticosteroids as maintenance. They had about 1,200 to 1,300 patients in each box. And when they studied these patients for about a year, here's what they found. If you're on inhaled corticosteroids throughout the year, you tend to have more number of well-controlled weeks, but the rate of your severe exacerbation is not inferior to those patients who were using an as-needed combination inhaler around. And those patients who used an as-needed combination alone tend to, to have, tend to have one fifth the ICS exposure. So less steroids potentially with no increase in rates of exacerbations 
and that was very exciting data to kind of see and review. This was a meta-analysis that was done and published in JAMA, and we did a sub-analysis on it, looking at the number needed to treat. And what was interesting to see is regardless of what you use as a comparator, whether it's a single therapy with an inner corticosteroid or a combination therapy with an inner corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist, and regardless of what dose you compare, there is an overall benefit in terms of exacerbation with SMART across the board. And that is very, very interesting to see. And that's what's been driving SMART to come into all the recent reports and guidelines. But SMART strategy by itself is not without criticism, right? So the first big thing you need to know is that more than 50% of patients who go on SMART eventually go back to using their albutrol. The other part that is, is not surprising is physician knowledge with this strategy is very suboptimal. In one study, it was estimated that 91% of physicians prescribing SMART were also prescribing albutrol alongside uh, the Symbicot, kind of defeating the purpose of a single inhaler. For us, the cost of uh, budesonide formitrol is a genuine concern, as is the long-acting beta agonist toxicity that we see at certain at-risk populations unique to the United States, such as the African-American population. And finally, the, the, the one thing that created a lot of confusion is these studies were essentially done with a dry powder inhaler called a turb inhaler. And in the United States, we all have a meter dose inhaler. So when guidelines put out um, the strategy, they put out a maximum formitrol at 72 mics per day for the turb inhaler, but we had no idea for the longest amount of time what to do with a metered inhaler, meter dose inhaler. But a lot of us were kind of doing apples to apples and coming up with 54 mics per day which fortunately is what's been shown in the NAEBP guidelines published last week. So what does that mean? How do you do that? Here's what I have done with the few patients that I have on SMART. I've told them to use the Symbicot two puffs twice a day on a regular basis, but if they were having particularly bad symptoms, they can increase it to 12 puffs a day. So I've done that four puffs three times a day, or I've done three puffs four times a day for about three days and then had them give me some feedback so that we know whether we need to pull the trigger on prednisone or not. In the few patients that I have tried SMART on, I should let you know I've had a lot of success, especially in my higher functioning patients. They've really come back and said, well, you just spared me a course of prednisone, that exacerbation around, which is a huge relief. So this is just the, the two forms of the inhaler that are around. This is the US form, the meter dose inhaler, and this is the dry powder version that's available outside the US. So this is what GINA looks like right now, right? So your first step is gonna be your as needed low dose inhaled corticosteroid for motorol combination. In your second step, you're gonna consider um, starting a patient on an inhaled corticosteroid. In your third step, you're gonna use a low dose combination. In your fourth step, you're gonna use a medium dose combination. And at step five, you're gonna start thinking of some pretty advanced things that I'm gonna to talk to you about, you know? So this is what our uh, new steps look like. Now, the other very important figure, which I'm, which I'm glad they put into the GINA report was this when to start, where to start figure. So the traditional notion was everybody used to start on step one, and that may still be applicable to patients who don't have a lot of symptom burden. But if your patient walks in with having symptoms most days or having frequent nighttime awakenings in a week, or having issues with lung function, you can certainly start them off with step four. You don't have to start them all the way down at step one. The other kind of faded box that people tend to miss is the fact that you don't have to reserve your short courses of oral corticosteroid only for exacerbation states. If your patient have a lot of symptom burden, you can actually give them a short course of prednisone, for example, just to reset them while the inhalers are kicking in. And people tend to miss that occasionally. So what does asthma therapy look like beyond step five? Well, the one that made a lot of uh, progress was a teotropium-based um, strategy. Without editorializing it too much, I can tell you it was kind of suspect that the company that came up with this drug changed the delivery device for asthma studies from the hand inhaler to the Respimat. But the Respimat is what they published most of their science on. So what was seen is regardless of what the baseline inhaler was, if you add teotropium to that, you, you can see an improvement in lung function, FEV1, but you also end up seeing an improvement in asthma control and a decrease in exacerbations. So that makes teotropium a very, very, very attractive add-on. But I should also point out there's a cost factor to it. 
So teotropium, for example, costs only $1,200 per year, which is still a lot of money, I know. But compared to $24,000 to $36,000 per patient per year for biologics, it is just a drop of water in the ocean. So teotropium is a very easy go-to for me as a next step when I'm getting to step four or five worth of therapy. The other thing that I'm kind of learning about and gaining experience on is chronic macrolide therapy for asthma. We have had a lot of experience using chronic azithromycin therapy for COPD, but not so much for asthma. The first true signal we saw was the Azizas study that was published in 2013, but chronic macrolide therapy didn't really catch on till 2017 until we had the AMAZES trial from Peter Gibson's group in Australia. So this was a double-blinded placebo-controlled study where they had asthma patients who were pretty symptomatic. They excluded those with prolonged QTC or hearing impairments, and patients in the study group got about 500 milligrams of azithromycin three times a week for a year. What they noticed was these patients in the study group tended to have uh, a decrease in the exacerbation rates, a decrease in the annualized exacerbation rates, and an increase in the number of exacerbation-free days that they had, which is, which is very, very compelling. I've had mixed success, not because of efficacy, but because of side effects. A lot of my patients are unfortunately unable to tolerate azithromycin because of GI side effects, particularly diarrhea. But I do use azithromycin, but when I'm thinking of teotropium or I'm thinking of chronic macrolide, I'm almost automatically also thinking of using a biologic or a monoclonal antibody at that point. So a biologic is essentially an antibody that targets a certain protein or receptor in the asthma pathway and hence kind of, 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 kind of mitigates the disease process. The first one we came up with was an IgG against IgE called omalizumab. This has been around from 2003, and it's one that we all have a lot of experience with. The next, uh, uh, next pathway we targeted was free floating, a free floating cytokine called interleukin-5. And we did that with a, with a subcutaneous injection called mepolizumab, and also with an intravenous infusion called reslizumab. We then moved on to targeting interleukin-5 receptors located on eosinophils with a drug called benralizumab. The next exciting drug that came out was dupilumab that targeted interleukin-4 and hence blocked interleukin-4 and 13 in the pathway of block, in the process of blocking interleukin-4 receptors. Dupilumab also has the unique advantage of being self-administered. So it was the first biologic that was truly approved for patients administering themselves at home and not having to come in for clinic visits, for example. We tried targeting interleukin-13 by itself with lebrikizumab and tralokinumab, but that didn't work out too well. But the one that everybody in my society is super excited and awaiting right now is an anti-thymic stromal lymphopoietin um, monoclonal called tizipilumab. This has had quite a lot of success and actually received FDA breakthrough um, designation almost a year ago, but final approval hasn't come through, presumably because of COVID-related delays. So these drugs have really changed our asthma management landscape, but as you can see, they're obviously targeting more the TH2 high pathways rather than the TH2 low pathways, and, and that's an area where we still need a lot of research and advancement. I'm going to leave this slide up here um, for anyone who wants to take a screenshot or a snapshot of it. Um, I can also send you this, this slide offline if you send me an email. It's essentially a slide that kind of summarizes the current FDA-approved uh, biologics, and each biologic has its own um, pros and cons associated with it, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about those offline. I have one slide about asthma and COVID because I felt that may be relevant to my audience. Um, the punchline is we're still not sure, right? Initial signals from small cohorts and even one week meta-analysis suggests that asthmatics don't necessarily have worse outcomes with COVID infection, COVID-19 infection than non-asthmatics. But still, we need to be really cautious because there's always been this kind of bad relationship between asthma and viral infections. There is some interim guidelines. Some of it is intuitive. So for example, don't de-escalate your patients completely until we get over this pandemic. If they're on oral corticosteroids, bring them to the lowest dose possible, but don't take it off. If they're on inhalers, bring them down to the lowest dose of inhaled corticosteroid, but don't take it off completely. For those of you who believe in it, you can definitely keep up with your written action plans. I have been giving as needed courses of prednisone for patients to keep at home with the hope that it spares them the emergency department visit. Avoid aerosolization procedures such as nebulizers, and in patients who are suspected for COVID illness, don't do spirometries in your clinic.
The next slide I kind of want to leave up there for a bit. Um, this is what I envision a patient, an asthma program would look like at VCU. In the center of the program would be the patient. You know, now not only will this program be delivering a higher level and a more, effic a more efficient care, efficient pathway for care, but also a timely pathway for care. What that means is patients would be seen within one to two weeks of the referral, and particularly if they're coming out of the hospital or the emergency room. I also envision this program to have a multidisciplinary approach. Of course, from specialties involved in allergy, immunology, rheumatology, and even potentially gastroenterology, but also with providers from pharmacy, respiratory therapy, and uh, social work services when possible. This program should have a huge research component to it. Not only will this elevate the program to a national level, but also give access to patients to resources which are otherwise not available in other sites. I've always seen that when there's an educational component to program, it makes me a better provider. I think teaching med students, residents, and fellows kind of drives me to keep up with the latest and greatest that's available in asthma care. And finally, I think we all know asthma doesn't live in a hospital or a healthcare system. It's, it's, it's pretty much prevalent in communities. So it's imperative to reach out to these communities and also imperative to kind of tap into resources that are already there, such as resources from the American Lung Association. So I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing this program evolve and kind of leading it as much as I can. A question that came up by email correspondence a few weeks ago is when to refer an asthma patient to this program? Well, the first thing you need to understand is is there a group of patients who are high risk of dying from asthma? And there's a lot of literature to kind of identify these folks. So if somebody's had a hospitalization or ED in the first in, in the last month, or if they've had two hospitalizations in the last year or three ED visits in the last year, there's somebody who probably should walk through the program. Also, and this is probably the biggest red flag, if somebody has had a serious exacerbation in their lifetime, that's an intubation or an ICU visit, they should be at least seen once by the program. Anyone who's using their albuterol more than they should. So for example, if you're using your albuterol more than three canisters per year, you're gonna end up in the EDL hospital. If you're using it more than 12, you're at high risk of dying. So they should be seen by the program. Anyone who's on steroids or coming off chronic corticosteroids should be seen by the program. Anyone who, who has special needs and, and will benefit from additional monitoring, such as those with psychiatric comorbidities, can definitely be referred to this program, you know, just to have easier access to care. Other possible indications, if you've tried three months worth of therapy and you're still having issues, or if your patients have atypical symptoms and signs and require diagnostic testing, such as PFTs, bronchoscopy, exhaled nitric oxide, or met methacholine channel, we're more than happy to see them in this program. Anyone who's on GINA step four or five level of therapy that we kind of spoke about, and anyone who's a candidate for advanced therapies, such as biologics, or is interested in participating in clinical trials can be seen by this program. So once this program is truly up and running, I think there's a good number of patients who kind of meet candidacy for it. And I look, care, I look forward to taking care of these patients and also kind of um, being part of your team that's providing care for these patients. So here's a couple of things I skipped that you can look up yourself is, the first one is a triple inhaler strategy that just got published um, earlier this year called, called the CAPTAIN study. So that's a single inhaler with fluticasone, umiclidinium, and Villantrol that had some positive data to support it. The actual Nas National Asthma Education and Prevention Program EPR4 report that came out on, on December 3rd, I think that's worth a read. It's 300 pages, but there's an at glance PDF that's only one page. This is a very nice guideline for anyone who's interested. It was published in the European Respiratory Journal in 2019, is the Joint Society Severe Asthma Management Guideline. And I kind of deliberately dodged this topic altogether, bronchial thermoplasty, which is a bronchoscopy-based catheter thermal frequency ablation of the airway smooth muscle. And this procedure has, has, has issues and, and, and it's still evolving, so I've left it out of my talk. Here are my take-homes for this talk. Asthma impacts patients and the healthcare system. It's important to get the diagnosis right early on because it's difficult to establish it once we start treatment. Focus on control and not just on severity. Fix inhaler adherence, fix comorbid conditions, and spend some time but not all time on environmental hygiene. These three interventions can make a big difference. Follow the GINA steps and get familiar with the newer versions of it. And finally, please understand that I'm here to help. So if needed, you can always reach out to me. And the best way to reach out to me is via email or cell phone. 
I'm more than I'm, I'm more than welcome messages, texts, or even phone calls for any patient who requires a little bit more assistance. With that, I'm happy to say I kind of beat the clock by five minutes, and I'm here to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the audience? I think the first question we have is, uh, Dr. Mahan, is can you comment on new asthma diagnoses in COVID patients? So that's a, that's a pretty loaded question, right? Um, we all are very nervous performing spirometry on these patients. Um, but unfortunately, that's what we have left. So despite our concerns with using peak flow, I think peak flows have managed to reestablish a role in asthma diagnosis, especially during COVID. So you give your patient a peak flow meter and ask them to maintain a diary, checking their peak flows in the mornings and evenings. And when they come back, you kind of average out their daily peak flows and look for variability. That's very acceptable in the time of COVID. The next alternative, which is somewhat suboptimal, is that you get a COVID test and then bring them back for spirometry, hoping that you get bronchodilator reversibility early on. But in the immediate future, at least till, till we have a, a larger vaccine program, it's, it's gonna be challenging to kind of make these diagnoses right. You know, In my limited experience here, I've already seen a fair share of new asthma evaluations without spirometry. And I'm always thinking it's not right to treat them, but I, I do have to start knowing that it's gonna take some time for them to, to um, to get this parametry done. Great, thank you. I see another question from Dr. Grossman. Um, Dr. Grossman asks, have you had problems getting insurance approval for inhalers needed for smart therapy? Um, she states that she feels as though she has not been really successful in getting greater than uh, one Simbacort inhaler per month. No, that is a very valid question, right? So if, Getting inhalers approved is a huge problem. And in that sense, smart therapy is being limited to truly mild asthma patients. Those are patients who don't need a maintenance Simbicort. These are patients who probably use the Simbicort only as needed and otherwise probably won't use any background maintenance therapy. So that's a valid question. What was exciting to see is that SMART did get endorsed by the EPR4 guidelines and now that it's made it to a US specific guidelines, hopefully payers should start getting, being a little more receptive to start paying for these inhalers, you know? So it is gonna be a learning process for us, our patients, but also for payers, but I think we can get there pretty soon. Great, thank you. And there's uh, another question in the chat. Um, and the question is, are there any protocols uh, for checking for diabetes or prediabetes in patients that you deem will require some oral prednisone therapy? Unfortunately, there are no protocols per se, but I was part of a study that, that had protocols in it for checking diabetes. So I think the, the onus of checking for diabetes or prediabetes is on the prescribing pulmonologist or allergist when they pull the trigger on starting oral therapy. I'm happy to look into it with anybody who's interested in the space. You know, Maybe it's time that we do have a pre-specified protocol looking at diabetes and even maybe laying a pathway out for bone density scanning and adrenal insufficiency checking in patients before they go on oral prednisone for asthma. Great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Well, I think as you've heard, Dr. Dr. Mohan will be make himself available. You see his, he's even given his cell phone number, which is, uh, I really appreciate you giving your cell phone number. <laughs> be, 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 be careful what you wish for. But uh, we certainly appreciate your, your willingness to engage everyone and to be available as we, as we enter this exciting phase of, of adding to the um, asthma programs that we've had in place here. Uh, so it's really our hope that we'll get eventually to a point where we can provide um, asthma care to every one of our patients and work towards keeping them out of the hospital and keeping them safe. So we, we very much appreciate um, all of your efforts uh, in, in helping us build this program. Absolutely. No, um, so I think really, I, no, really please go ahead. To be here. So with that being said, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Mohan. Um, he's here to help. 
and you'll be seeing and hearing more from him um, over the coming months regarding our asthma program. Um, and certainly also for residents and fellows, please also engage with Dr. Mohan if you are interested in conducting some uh, research uh, with him or if you have some, some new ideas, uh, I know he's very open to that as well. So with that, we're right at one o'clock. I really wanna thank again, Dr. Mohan for, for giving a fantastic update, fantastic presentation. Um, and we wish everyone well and have a, a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Pat. Have a good day.